Have you ever felt like you gave up on a good idea? <laughs> you get to the first part of the year, you say, you know what, I, I probably shouldn't be watching 14 series on Netflix. I should read more. I, I should do some more reading. That's a good idea. You should. You should read more. And then Yellowstone, the next season comes out. You're like, maybe next year, right? Maybe next year. You gave up on a good idea. You, you get to the beginning of that, of that year and you say, this is the year. This is the year I start eating clean. This is the year I get jacked, right? This is the year that I take some LBs off, take some inches off the waist. This is the year I get looking, looking nice from my spouse. I'm going to do it. And then you drive by a five guys. <laughs> you had a good idea, but you gave up on that good idea. Five guys got you again. Uh, let's be a little more serious. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're in the process of giving up on your marriage. Marriage is a good idea. It's God's idea. It's not an easy idea. Maybe some of you already have. Maybe, you, maybe some of you have left a marriage that you shouldn't have left. Maybe, maybe some of you are staying in a marriage, but you have no intention of investing in that marriage. You gave up on a good idea. And parenting's another one. I'm just going to give you a phone. I'm going to give you a screen. Just leave me alone. <laughs> Parenting is God's idea. God gave those kids to me and to you, and sometimes we feel like I, I want to give up on this idea. How about church? Maybe, maybe you gave up on church. Maybe you went to a church and something happened or someone happened, and you say, man, <laughs> if this is what church is, if this is what Christianity is, I, I want no parts of this. I, I love introducing the church as a group of people bringing the future kingdom of God into the present. That we're a group of people who believe that when Jesus came, he instituted and installed a kingdom that will one day come. That we are in the space between, but right now we are the examples of what the kingdom of God is. If you want to know what the kingdom of God is, you got to come to church and, and you'll see it there. We are a changed people being changed. A changed people having our minds renewed having our character recreated. And those things are supposed to create a redemptive community, a safe community, a healthy community, a community that people want to be a part of. And at the exact same time, church is hard. Church is hard. I've been hurt in the church. I've been connected to church for many, many, many years, not just as a pastor, just as a Christian. I've been hurt by people in the church. I've been hurt by people that I thought were my friends. I've been hurt by people I thought were loyal to me. I, I, I got damage in church. I got no issue with church. I got issue with some people in church. I believe, though, in who Jesus is. And I believe in what he's making us. Paul seemed to think it was pretty indispensable. But sometimes the church needs a reminder of what the church is. We need a reminder of what God's up to, what he has accomplished, and what he is accomplishing. And so Paul in the book of Ephesians has been building a case. From chapter 1 to chapter 3, he's saying again and again and again, this is who you are. Not this is what you need to go do, this is who you are. You need to rest, you need to sit, you need to receive. In chapter 4, he starts chapter 4, therefore. It's not a new idea, it's a continuation of the same idea. And he begins to apply who we are in Jesus First, kind of through some principles, and now he's going to start unpacking it in the context of some relationships. He's going to start today to talk to us about the kind of church that should exist because of changed people. And then he's going to talk to us about marriages and families and work. Over the next month, we're going to talk church, marriage, parenting, work. These are really the foundational relationships of a Christian. I think that sometimes... We compartmentalize them. I got my Sunday, my Sunday get up, my Sunday character, my Sunday words, my Sunday behaviors, and then I got Monday. Come on, somebody. And don't even get me started on Friday night because that's a whole nother thing, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we don't understand that the Bible says that these all face each other. They all affect each other. It's impossible for us to have a healthy church if we don't have healthy relationships. It's impossible for us to have a healthy church if we don't have healthy marriages. 
Listen, I can preach. I, I can be Charles Spurgeon reincarnated. Pastor Brandon can lead the best worship set in the history of the world. We can do all of these things. But if your marriage is trash, our church is struggling. We can't be a healthy church without honest work. Listen, I can't have people who come here and worship God and go out and steal from their boss. That doesn't make us a healthy church. And, and let's be honest, toxic churches affect our marriages. They affect our relationships. These things face each, face each other. It's all tied together in Paul's mind, and it should be tied together in our mind. We are holistically changed by the gospel. It should holistically affect our relationships. So let's pick it up in Ephesians 5 and verse 7. Ephesians 5, 7 to 21. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, and now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul is going to begin to apply our change to the church. He's going to give us two things that we ought to be doing and the way that we are able to do them. Two things we ought to be doing and the way that we are able to do them. The first is this in 5 and verse 8, church, walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. Now, it's hard to read Paul in Ephesians and not be brought into remembrance of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Matthew 5 and verse 14. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they can see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, let me... Let me pass to you here for a minute and connect some dots to you here for a minute. Um, as I've been studying this idea of light and city on a hill, I wanted to study it theologically, and then I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out some of the other places that this idea of a city on a hill shows up. And it's interesting to observe how American politicians have co-opted the idea of a city on a hill. I'm not going to get political. Just hear me out. I want to pass to you here for a second. They haven't talked about city on a hill the way that Paul and Jesus do. It's the Christian and the church. They've talked about a city on a hill as a nation called America. To describe their plan for American exceptionalism and manifest destiny, the first guy that did it was JFK. In 1960, he gave a speech. The title of that speech was A City on a Hill. He quoted a Puritan preacher by the name of John Winthrop in that sermon. A sermon he gave, he quoted, didn't apply it to the church, applied it to the country. Ronald Reagan did it again, quoting JFK, quoting Pastor Winthrop. Obama did it, Mitt Romney did it, both sides of the aisle. Now, why does this matter? Why does it matter? Hear me out. Because it's important to be very clear about who and what the light that is being referenced is and is not. Who are we talking about here? And this is important because I believe that there has been an intentional convergence of religion and politics in this country. An intentional convergence of religion and of politics. One of my favorite authors is a guy by the name of Leslie Newbegin. What a great name, right? Newbegin was born in 1909. Spent the majority of his ministry in India as a missionary. When he came back to the UK, he was struck with how post-Christian England had become. How pagan England had become. Things that were just assumed we didn't assume anymore. 
And he was one of the first guys to start talking about the West moving past being a Christian country and into being a post-Christian society. And he said that there was a need for the church in the West to acknowledge this and acknowledge that we're not just the country that sends missionaries, but we should be the, the country that the churches are missionaries to the culture that surrounds us as it moves past this Christian era of our development. He said that if this didn't occur, the church in the West would continue to decline in size and in influence, and he gave a reason. He said the reason is not that the culture will become more pagan. In the church, we love to talk about the reason that the church isn't doing well is because those people out there are getting more and more pagan. Newbegin says that's not the reason. He said the reason that the the culture is getting more pagan is that the church is getting more political. He said that the church would move to a space, and he, this is in the 60s, y'all, that he's saying this, where our, where, where our faith in the scripture wouldn't just inform our politics, they would become our politics. That our theology and our dogma would merge together with our political preferences and ideologies. And that when that happened, the church would dramatically lose influence in the culture. I, I want to be abundantly clear with you that neither Paul or Jesus talked about the light as an earthly nation. Rather, it was a heavenly kingdom with a king named Jesus and a constitution that we see in the Sermon on the Mount. It was a kingdom that has been brought and will come when Jesus comes back. Currently, it's a spiritual kingdom. Eventually, let it be today, it's going to be a physical kingdom. And when that physical kingdom comes, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. My concern pastorally for us is that there are lots of different other options of what you think could fix the problem. And my presumption to you is that the enemy doesn't care what you think will fix the problem as long as it isn't Jesus and the church. Yeah, 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 DC, yeah, 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 NFL, yeah, 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 whatever. Just give up on a good idea. Just give up on a good idea. And so Paul says in no uncertain terms, you are light. Not take light and walk around with it. He says, you're it. You are light in the Lord. Jesus says light cannot be hidden unless you put something over it. So Paul says, hey, don't, don't partner with darkness. Just don't partner with it. Don't let it in. Don't call it the same thing. Rather, expose that. He doesn't say just avoid darkness. He says expose darkness. I think in the church, a lot of times we feel content to just not do naughty things. Oh, no, 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 I would never do that. Congratulations. Are you exposing when it's done? Are you exposing when it's done? Now, Paul isn't saying you should be religious finger-pointing policemen. You're naughty, you're naughty, you're naughty. No, no, no. He, he's saying your very existence, your very kingdom presence should expose darkness in your cities. The fact that you're there the fact that you're there with Jesus as king, a part of a kingdom that has come and will come, means that you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. Ain't nobody else doing that. Means that you're going to be more kind when things get more polarized. Means that you're going you're gonna to love your enemies. And you're going to pray for those that despitefully use you. Means you're going to stand up for the least of these, the folks that can't pay you back, can't get you likes on social media. You're going to stand up for justice when justice is unpopular. That your presence, not your finger pointing, not your bullhorn from the corner, not your social media rants, no, just you being a changed Christian. And Paul says, don't, don't co-op darkness into that. I need your light to be, to be as bright as possible. He says, don't, don't, don't partner with it, take no part in it. He says, actually, take it, take the darkness and make it light. Wake it up. Hey, this is what a church does. A church doesn't partner with darkness. A church exposes darkness. A church wakes up. Hey, wake up, y'all. This isn't how it is. Wake up, y'all. This isn't what's going on. Wake up, y'all. You don't 
fight against flesh and blood, but there's actually principalities and powers. Wake up, y'all. Satan has a plan for you just as much as God has a plan for you. Wake up, wake up. And, and Paul says, and sometimes you just gotta drag it out of the dark and in the light and go, here it is. I actually think that that's part of my job as a preacher is to take things that are in the shadows and drag them into the light of scripture and say, here it is. Here it is. So watch this. Uh, no church, if there's no church, no distinct church, no changed church, there's no light. There's no light. We're it, y'all. You're the light. Some of you are giving up on a good idea. You say it doesn't feel like a good idea. Well, let's just think through this for a second. I get it. Church is complicated. Church does dumb stuff. Church has created trauma, drama, stress. You get it? All right. You hear me? Okay. Actually, not church. People in a church. Okay. I get it. But let's just take it out of the equation. There is no church in Kansas City. Here's what God says. Then the darkness is free to roam. The darkness is, and there's no one there to expose it. There's no, no one there to drag it in the light. There's no different there's no different version. You just take Graceway out of Raytown. It's just gone. You think it's stressful now. The church is the front line of defense, y'all. Your changed life, your testimony, you walking as light is God's way to keep the darkness back. Don't give up on a good idea. Don't give up on a good idea. And, and I want to say that corporately, okay? The church corporately is the front line of defense, but I also want to say it individually, that the pull of darkness on your life has to be met with your involvement in a community of light. I mean, I've watched this so many times over, over my time in pastoral ministry. Somebody gets sideways with somebody in the church, they ascribe that trauma to the church in, in mass and decide, I'm going to leave the church. Okay. And they leave, and they leave that community of light, that imperfect community of light, in six months, nine months, 10 months, 12 months, they come back more harassed, more hassled, more helpless, more beat up, because it's darker out there than it is in here. You need to be in a church. It's not perfect. And if we were perfect, it stopped being when you showed up. I'm just kidding. It's not perfect because I'm here. It was already not perfect. But can I tell you, the light that is in here is in stark contrast than the, to the darkness that is out there. You need to be a part of a church. You need to be a part of a church. This is the reason Hebrews 10.25 says, hey, don't neglect to meet together and to encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. All the more as you see the, see the world getting crazy, get to church so you can be encouraged, be together, be around light, y'all. Secondly, Paul says, first walk, of, walk as light. Second, walk is wise. And he, and he talks about this idea of redeeming the time, making the best use of the time. And, and I've heard this talked about, like, Christians need to be efficient. Like, stop watching Netflix. Be efficient. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's not talking about efficiency. He's talking about sovereignty. What do I mean by that? Do you know that you could have been born anywhere, at any time, in any place, but God picked for you to be born now. In this place, you live here now. I don't know what the circumstances are, but in the sovereignty of God, you're here. Lots of times we say, man, it would be great if I lived there or at a different time or in a different way or the world was different. Well, it ain't, and you aren't. You're here now. Why? Because apparently, God has purpose for you specifically and generally around your time, 2024, Kansas City, Missouri, or Kansas. <laughs> Make the best use. Hey, Graceway, you were planted in 1943 during World War II and you've existed for 81 years and we're in an election year. Be wise, be light, don't partner with darkness. Don't fall for the same spiel. Don't be a sucker. Come on, somebody. Let's not do it again. Be wise. You're in this time. Understand under the sovereignty of God. And what does Paul say? Understand the will of the Lord. Understand what God's doing. Understand what God wants to do, what God wants to say, what God says is right, what God says is good. 
This is the changed life. This is bringing the kingdom, a followable blueprint. Can I tell you, uh, in the church, we do marriage different. We do. We do marriage different. We, we think that you should seek God for who you're supposed to, marriage, to, to marry. And, and we think that when you get married, you're, you, submission and respect and preferring one another and forgiveness. Can I tell you, ain't nobody else doing it like that? We do sex differently. We say you shouldn't sleep with somebody who you haven't in covenant committed to. We say you shouldn't sleep with somebody until you have. Can I tell you the world's like, for real? You're going to be all old-fashioned? Look at my face. Yeah. And in a couple years, you can come in and we'll offer you counseling. We do sex different. We do work different. We believe an honest amount of work for an honest amount of pay. We believe in submitting to authority, even if your, your authority's not honorable. We believe that you show up and you're the best employee or you're the best boss because you're a Christian. We handle money differently. We think that all of our money <laughs> isn't ours. We actually think, according to that principle, that the first 10% of all money you make, you should return back to God. Here, listen, it isn't giving, it's returning. Because it's all God's. And so the first of every week, 10% as God has prospered you. Can I tell you, the world's like, how are you going to live on 90%? We do it different, y'all. We do it different. We handle conflict different. In, in the church, if you're offended, you don't gossip. You go to the person privately. And if you know you've offended them, you go to them privately. We pursue reconciliation in the church. We offer forgiveness in the church. Listen, just go on social media for a minute and see whether or not the world's doing that. We handle power and privilege differently. We think power isn't for the person, it's for the people. We think privilege isn't for me, it's for service, Philippians 2. We think that we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, and, and all of these principles aren't just spoken, they're supposed to be exemplified in the church. Can I say some of you right now, some of you right now, you are walking in a way that is unwise because you're trying to do it like the world. You're walking in a way that, yes, everyone else is doing it, but not the people of God. And my prayer for you is that you will know who you are, know what God has accomplished in your life, that you'll repent of not walking in the light and not walking in wisdom, and that you'll do it the way that God says is best. Watch, not just for you, so that I have an example of somebody to point to, hey, I'm about to get married, look at them. I don't know how to handle my finances, look at them. I don't know how to handle conflict, look at them. It's not just for you, it's for us. No church, no light, no church, no wisdom. No church, nobody regularly standing up and saying, thus saith the Lord. No wisdom. No light to my feet, no path for me to walk. No example of a well-lived life. I get it, it's hard. No, no example of blessing, no example of, whoo, God's, God's right. Take, take the church out. And he gave up on a good idea. Okay, now, when Paul's talking, we tend to think that Paul is giving us to-do lists. Paul's never giving us to-do lists. Paul is talking about all of these things coming to pass because of what God has done. And so when he says walk as light and walk as wise, it's not something for us to achieve. It's been achieved for us. So Paul's going to teach us how to naturally do who we are because of what God has done. Shake your head if you understand what I'm saying right now. So Paul's next thing is how do we walk as light and walk as wise. 5 and 18, here it is. Be filled with the Spirit. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Now, this is a bit of a pet peeve for me. Because I want to be clear that a spirit-filled church is not a denominational reference. It's frustrating to me because I, I, I hear people, they come in and say, are you a spirit-filled church? And people are like, I thought we were Baptist. <laughs> Which is funny. <laughs> Can I, let me say it to you this way. You, you can't be Bible-based and not be spirit-filled. 
because the Spirit's the one who wrote the Bible that you're based on. And this thing that has happened where, where, where we say, we're not spirit-filled, we believe the Bible, all you're really saying is, nah, we're just grumpy, dry, lifeless, boring. Because all the power comes from the Holy Spirit. So spirit-filled is not a denomination. It's not even a voluntary theology. It is an accomplished state of every Christian in this room. I hope you're spirit-filled or when you drop dead, you're gonna split hell wide open. (laughs) Paul is not talking about us getting more of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit getting more of us. So what does spirit-filled mean? I wanna make this as simple as I can. A spirit-filled person is a surrendered person. Listen, I'm... We're going to talk next week about spirit-filled husbands and wives, spirit-filled parents, spirit-filled employees, spirit-filled bosses. What does that mean? It means I get up in the morning and I say to God, whatever this day brings, it's entirely yours. You're in charge. You're the boss. I worship you. I honor you. I praise you. I surrender myself to you. Paul compares filling to intoxication. Why? Because pagan, the pagan community believed that intoxication led to inspiration and communication with God. And Paul says, you ain't got a drink to hear from God. He's already here. You just need to surrender so you can hear what he says to say. This is not to say that somebody who is filled with the Spirit acts crazy, acts inebriated, falls over on a stage. That's not what it is. It is to say this is a person under the control of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. And the verb that Paul uses, be filled, listen, is a command. It's not a suggestion. So when you get up on Monday, you get sideways with your spouse, you're clawing each other's eyes out, ah, no love, no joy, no peace, no gentleness, no goodness, no meekness. You're not spirit-filled. You go to work and you're gossiping about your boss. You're frustrated with the kids. You're, all, you're, not, you're not spirit-filled. You're not surrendered. You're not surrendered to the way that God says to do it. And it's not a voluntary suggestion. It's a command. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. This verb is plural, meaning it's not just a select few. Like the, the ones with seminary degrees get spirit-filled. The rest of you all are on your own. That's not what it is. If you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit, all of him. It's passive, meaning you don't earn the Holy Spirit, you're gifted the Holy Spirit. There's a teaching that is you get saved and then once you get to a level of purity and faith, then you get the Holy Spirit. That is not biblical. There is nothing about what you get from God that you earn. If you needed to earn it, we would never get it. It's passive. God gives it. It's present tense, meaning that Paul envisions it as an ongoing reality, not a dramatic experience. Listen, we have some of you have had this experience. You go, you go to a room and something happens and you have an experience with the Holy Spirit and you fall over on a stage or you start doing something. With, oh, they got the Spirit. Did they not have them before? So you mean they got saved? No, no, no. They, they got, what are we talking about? The feeling of the Holy Spirit isn't something that's like, wham, they, oh, they, they, they did it. No, it's I'm, I'm being controlled perpetually gladly by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying you don't go into a room and God doesn't do something outside of all of our pay grades, but I'm saying let's not chase experience for something we already have. The command to be filled is meant to be an ongoing reality. Not that there are times that you don't have the Holy Spirit, but that there are times that the Holy Spirit, you aren't listening to him. Are you with me? So Paul says, be a spirit-filled church. You say, wait, does that mean that, no, that that doesn't mean that we're a anything. It means that we're obeying the Bible. You say, well, I've never been to like a Bible-based, spirit-filled, non-this, kind of this. Welcome to Graceway, y'all. 
We, we are commanded to be spirit-filled and commanded to be Bible-based. What denomination does that make us? Graceway. <laughs> That's what it makes us. So the result of a spirit-filled church, three ways you can know for spirit-filled. Are you with me? First, it's a praising community. Paul says, sing together and toward one another. Sing together and toward one another. So here's what God says. When you sing praise to me, this is Psalm 22, I inhabit your praise and I'm enthroned on your praise. So we sing these songs and God says, y'all start singing and I come running into the room. And when you start singing, not only do I come into the room, but I take the seat that is only mine in the room. There's a vertical element to praise. That is, you are just praising the recipient of the only one who is worthy of your praise, that being God. The Psalms talk a massive amount about this, but there's also a horizontal element of praise. And I've heard this all my life. You shouldn't act crazy in church because it's a distraction and, you know, we're not singing to each other. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Paul says there, there's a horizontal and a vertical element. Now, it doesn't mean that I do something so I can be seen. But if I happen to be seen, I accept that as I praise God, I teach you. I point to him. I guide to him. I understand that worship ministers to God and to one another. So let me say it this way. I love seeing acts of worship. I love, I love seeing dream teamers who come to serve, not because of what they do, because of their heart to serve. I love seeing that. I love when we take communion. It's an act of worship. I love when we give together. It's an act of worship. I love when my man Gigi Diaz gets in the pool and bang, 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 bang <laughs> right? And gets baptized. It's an act of worship. I love seeing it, but can I tell you, I also love hearing it. Most Sundays, I stand on the front row with my eyes closed and my lips sealed and just listen to y'all sing. And there's something that happens in me as I listen to you not sing to me, but sing around me. You know a church isn't spirit-filled, hear me, when people aren't singing. When people don't sing, they aren't spirit-filled. You say, I don't sing. I don't sing very well. It doesn't say when people sing well, they're spirit filled. It does say that when you stand there with a grumpy look on your face, your arms crossed and your lips shut, you steal something from God and me. And so I need you to begin to pray, Graceway, for your heart as you come into church. Not, not once you get here, I'll figure it out. No, as I come in, God, fill me with your spirit. Give me a spirit of praise so that I can bless your heart and the members of Graceway's heart. Can, can I be real honest with you? There's a reason it takes us two or three songs to get warmed up. You know what it is? It's that the flesh is kind of coming off us. Our perspective is getting onto Jesus. I would love it if that first song was a banger, y'all. We only got like three and a half songs. We ain't going to be here all day. Let's make it count. Why? Because that's what a spirit-filled church does. That first note, I'm not out there with my coffee strolling in. Whoa, we're singing. I got to get in there. <laughs> I'm dead serious, y'all. I'm dead serious. Secondly, it's a grateful community. First is a praising community. Second is a grateful community. Saying thanks together and to one another. And to one another. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8, 18. In everything, give thanks. In everything. You say, how am I going to give thanks in everything? There's a famous story. Matthew Henry, in response to his wallet being stolen, said, let me be thankful. First, that I've never been robbed before. Second, that although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, that although they took my all, it wasn't that much. <laughs> and fourth, that even though I was robbed, I have never been the one who robbed. How, how do you be thankful if you're the carnies right now? Well, you be thankful that you showed up 
and you got everybody out, and that's something that you can rebuild, we're going to help you rebuild. It's not that it isn't hard. It's not that there aren't difficult things. But there's always something to be thankful for. And, and God says, always say thanks to me. And say thanks to each other. Say thank you to God in front of each other. 1 Corinthians 14, 16. Say thank you to God out loud so that others can hear you and be built up by it. Have you ever been around somebody who couldn't stop complaining? No matter what, just complain, 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 complain. Have you ever turned to them and went, I just want you to thank you for encouraging me today. <laughs> All of your complaining has really built me up, really edified me, really created optimism in me. No, I'm not balling up my fist because I'm unhappy. I'm just... <laughs> Unreal. At the same time, have you ever been around somebody who was just almost illogically grateful? And said it, not felt it, said it. What, did, what happened to you? It did something to you. A spirit-filled church is a grateful church. You know a, a church isn't spirit-filled when it's always complaining. I don't like this song. I don't like the volume. I don't like the carpet. I don't like the coffee. I don't like Tim's pants. Like, you're crazy if you don't like these pants, all right? These pants are amazing. Come on, somebody, all right? Can I tell you if, you, if you can't stop complaining, all I need you to walk around saying is, I'm not spirit-filled. I'm not spirit-filled. I'm not spirit-filled. I'm not saying point stuff, don't fail. Point stuff out when it's wrong. But some of y'all are always finding something that's wrong. In your life, in the church, with your spouse, with your kids, at the job, in the traffic, with the chiefs, just stop. A spirit-filled church is a grateful church. And then thirdly, and this is going to set us up for next week, a spirit-filled church is a humble church. Submitting together and to one another. So what is church? We are a group of people under the authority of God. A good church understands that the lead pastor isn't a bald guy with incredible pants. <laughs> the lead pastor is God. He's in charge. My job isn't to tell you what I think. My job is to say to the very best of my ability, this is what the king says. We are submitted together and we're submitted to one another. We have a posture of humility, of deference, of preference, of how low can I go? And you know a church isn't spirit-filled when it's unkind. You know a church isn't spirit-filled when it demands its preferences. You know a church isn't spirit-filled when we gossip and we criticize. You know a church isn't spirit-filled when it won't forgive. So Paul says, be wise, walk as light, be filled, and then you'll be singing, you'll be grateful, and you'll be humble. And what I need you to understand is that if there's no filling, there's no power. The presence of the Holy Spirit is what gives the power, the presence, the joy. That isn't us, that's Him. And if the Holy Spirit leaves this room, all you got is self-centered, complaining, proud people who happen to gather in a location once a week, sometime around Sunday, 9 a.m. or 10.30. And I don't want to be a part of that kind of church, do you? Listen, if you're new here and you're not a Christian and church is like, what, what is this? I, I want to tell you what church is. Uh, church is a group of people, a congregation. We congregate in a place who are trying to live by another kingdom and another king. A future kingdom that Jesus started when he came to this earth and he will one day come and reclaim. And he's going to make everything new and everything right and everything whole and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But we're trying to live now because of what we know is going to happen then. Jesus is the blueprint. I want to, I want you, I want to help you because some of you, you're looking at churches, you're like, that doesn't look like that. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Look at Jesus. Look to Jesus. There's no one like him. 
There's no one like him. Figure out the, the real McCoy and then worry about what other church folks are doing, okay? Maybe you're a Christian and you say, this is all well and good, but, but bro, I've, I've been crazy hurt by the church. You know, we love to talk about changed and being changed, but here's the reality of it. Sometimes you bump into somebody at church who's in the process of being changed and you just got them at the wrong time. Yes, they need to be sanctified. Yes, God's going to do that. Yes, they're, they're a work in progress, just like you are. They don't, they don't look like they're changed, and they're hurting me in ways that don't feel very Christian. What am I supposed to do with that? First off, don't give up on a good idea called the church because of a person who attends the church. And secondly, you need to forgive them. You need to forgive them because you are letting the community of light be infected by the darkness that was created by the decision that they made. And I don't want you to lose out on the blessing of the church because of somebody who was a work in progress and just happened to come to the church that you went to. I don't want you to lose out on what the church is supposed to be because of some guy who stood on a stage like me and made a decision. God's bigger than that. Jesus is more beautiful than that. I don't want you to miss out on that. And maybe you're somebody you say, man, I, I'm, I'm good, I'm not hurt, I'm not new, but, but bro, I'm frustrated. And I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm a little in this camp right now. I'm frustrated with what's going on in the world. I'm tired, man. I'm tired of watching the news. I'm, I'm tired of watching brothers and sisters at other churches and scandals, and I'm, I'm frustrated. And I think Paul would say, Hey, don't give up on a good idea. Don't give up on a good idea called the church. And by the way, don't ever forget the church was God's idea and God will never give up on the church. If you want to be a part of what God's doing, you got to be connected to the church. I know it's exhausting. I know it's frustrating. I know you've been hurt. Maybe you're new, but God's doing a good thing through a good idea called the church. And I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. God, we love you today, and God, we come to you and just in all the ways that we know how as this church, 81 years young, we just repent of all the ways that we've done it our own way and the damage that it's caused of self-will, of preferences, of pride, of things, Lord, that keep us from being the light and offering the wisdom that you say is available. God, of, forgive us for doing church without your Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to be what you want us to be. We want to do what you want us, want us to do. And so I just pray for every person in this room or anyone watching online, Lord, that you would encourage them today, that you're doing a good thing. You do wonderful things. Do not give up. Do not give up, but to trust again, to believe again, to hope again, to be a part of what you're doing in this world. I thank you for the church. More than that, I thank you for Jesus. I love him and I love, I love this. I pray that you'll be glorified in our lives. We love you, we thank you in Jesus' name.